Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Tria and I'm an F1 doctor working in London. If you don't know what F1 means, then you've come to the right place, because today I'm going to talk you through the UK medical training system that starts from being a medical student and ends up with being an expert in your field. The whole system can be quite confusing with lots of different acronyms and abbreviations, so I'm going to do my best to make things a little bit clearer, which will hopefully help you whether you're thinking about starting on this journey, whether you're in it already, or even if you're a patient, just to understand a little bit better what type of doctor is treating you. Let's get into the video. So the journey starts with medical school. So the basic course in the UK is five years long, and you can do an intercalated degree on top of this, which will be one extra year. Typically, the first two or three years is known as preclinical medical school, and in these years you mainly have lectures and practicals. Then you have two or three years of clinical medicine, where you're rotating between different wards in hospitals, and you're expected to learn with a more hands-on approach. I've made a video about how my medical school, Oxford, was structured, so you can check that out if you're interested. If you're studying graduate entry medicine, then typically these are accelerated courses which last four years. And once you've graduated medicine, you'll get a medical degree, which is usually an MBBS or BMBCH as it's known in Oxford. So before I get into the details of the training pathway, I thought I'd talk about some common terminology that's used to describe doctors of different levels of training. So you have FY1, which stands for Foundation Year 1. Now this is your first year after graduation. And then FY2 doctors are in their second year after graduation. Then you might often hear the term SHO, which stands for Senior House Officer. Now this is an old fashioned term, which basically describes any doctors in training from the FY2 level to before they enter specialty training. It's not really supposed to be used anymore, but you'll often see it written down. Okay, so another term you might hear is an ST doctor, which is a doctor in a specific training pathway. You might hear ST with a number attached to the end, for example, ST4 in emergency medicine. And now this means that this doctor is in the fourth year of their emergency medicine training pathway. Okay, so another term you might hear is registrar. And a registrar is a doctor who is in higher specialty training and they're typically on their way to becoming a consultant in their field. So for example, you can be a registrar in psychiatry or cardiology or general surgery. You're usually a registrar for a number of years. The exact number depends on which specialty you're training in. So I'm currently working in the emergency department or A&E of a hospital. Now it's quite useful where I work because everyone wears scrubs which are colour coded according to their rank. Foundation doctors and SHO doctors wear blue scrubs, then registrars wear green and consultants wear grey scrubs. So finally, consultant is a senior doctor who's finished all of their training and are now considered experts in their field. These doctors are listed on the GMC's specialist register. You may also hear some other terms being thrown around, such as LED doctors, which stands for locally employed doctors or SAS doctors which stands for Specialty and Associate Specialist Doctors. Now these are terms for doctors who aren't in the traditional training scheme. And then another term you'll hear is a GP, which stands for General Practitioners. Now these are primary care physicians who are sometimes known in other countries as family doctors. I should mention at this point that I'm not a big fan of hierarchy in general, especially when people use their power to belittle or undermine juniors. This doesn't happen with everyone, but it does occur. Yes, obviously I do accept that experience is really important in medicine, and there's a good reason why it takes years to become a consultant because you really just do need that experience but I do wish there was a better way of dealing with hierarchy on a day-to-day -day basis. So now let's talk about the foundation program. So once you've graduated from medical school you're officially a doctor and in the UK you have to join something called the foundation program. Now this is a two-year job where you typically rotate between six specialties and you do four months in each specialty. Usually you'll have a mix between medical specialties, surgical specialties and community placements. So for example I am currently in foundation year one and I'm in my first rotation and the six rotations that I have are emergency medicine, obstetrics and gynaecology, gastroenterology, general medicine, geriatrics, and medical oncology. There is an element of choice when you apply for foundation jobs in your final year of medical school, and once you've been allocated to a specific deanery, you can rank jobs according to your preferences. Once you've completed your F1 year, you become fully registered to practice medicine with the GMC or the General Medical Council. 
So full registration with the GMC lets you practice unsupervised or start your private practice. You can now also take your degree and go and work as a doctor in another country. Now this process is slightly different if you've studied undergraduate medicine outside of the UK, but I'll talk more about that in a separate video. It's important to know there are also some variations of the traditional foundation program. For example, you can apply to the Specialised Foundation Program, or SFP, which used to be known as Academic Foundation. Typically, one of your four-month placements will be a research placement. Another type of foundation program is the Psychiatry Foundation Fellowship, which has a specific focus on psychiatry. And then you also have something called the Priority Program, which is typically situated in parts of the UK which are less popular. And going to these places usually comes with incentives such as the ability to do postgraduate degrees or more money. Doing F1 and F2 is a good time to think about what specialty you'd like to go into if medicine is your thing. It's also a good time to get some experience in. If you're interested in a specific specialty but you don't have a four month rotation in that subject, then it's okay because you can do these things called taster weeks. Some people also take postgraduate exams for higher specialty training at this point. But it's also completely okay if you come out of the two year foundation program still not knowing what you want to do. I still have no idea what I want to do. So now I'm going to talk about something called F3. I think this next section is really important, especially in recent years. So F3 technically stands for Foundation Year 3. Now this isn't a training grade, but it represents a natural gap in the training pathway. At this point, often doctors step out of the training pathway to pursue other interests, postgraduate degrees, or just to have a break really. And it's become such a popular and common thing to do that people have colloquially named it the F3 year. So just some examples of things you can do in this year. If you're interested in a specific specialty that you haven't worked in before, you can take this time to get some clinical experience in that specialty, for example by working as a JCF or Junior Clinical Fellow. If you're interested in teaching, you can also do an educational fellowship role where you will work in a department part-time and then spend the rest of your time teaching undergrad medical students and foundation year doctors. Another common thing that people do is work as a locum doctor, and locum is basically a temp job where you fill a gap in a rota in a specific department for a short period of time. And now because of this rota gap, you're usually paid at escalated rates, quite a bit more than you'd earn if you were just working as a foundation year doctor. So this is often quite a popular option. Some people work as a locum doctor for a few months, save up a lot of money and then go and travel. Some people do master's degrees in things like public health, global health or something completely unrelated to medicine. And then some people go and work in another country. So Australia is quite popular for UK doctors and also New Zealand and Canada. So taking an F3 year is becoming increasingly popular amongst UK doctors. So one report showed that where in 2011, 71% of F2 doctors would go straight into training. This number dropped to 43% in 2017. So that's a huge drop. And bearing in mind that this was pre-pandemic, so now that number has decreased even further and very few people actually go straight into a training job. Now, there's lots of reasons for this trend, burnout being one of them, but also people want to explore career options outside of the NHS. Certainly, almost every junior doctor that I've ever spoken to has either taken an F3 year or are definitely going to take one. I mean, I certainly will do. And also, this career break doesn't have to just be one year. Some people take more than one year out of training, and I know people who are in the F4, F5 years, and so on. So now you've successfully completed your foundation program and it's time to decide what specialty you want to pursue. Now there's lots of ways of going through training that depend on the individual specialty you're interested in and also lots of other factors such as what country you studied in, when you joined the program and so on. So these training pathways can be quite confusing but it is possible to generalise them to a certain extent. So once you finish the foundation program you generally take one of three broad parts so that's medicine, surgery or GP. Now obviously there are some specialties that combine elements of medicine and surgery, such as obstetrics and gynaecology. But typically, you'll start with a few years of core training, which can be in medicine or surgery. Now if you want to be a GP, you follow a three-year GP training course that ends up with you being a fully qualified GP. If you're interested in pursuing medicine or surgery, then typically you'll start a core training program for a few years. Now this can be in core medicine, core surgery, or something called ACCS which stands for Acute Care Common STEM. After these core years, you'll then apply to higher specialty training, which will ultimately lead on to becoming a consultant. In terms of timeframes, the foundation program typically takes two years, after which core training usually lasts three years, and then higher specialty training can last anywhere between three to five years. 
People generally say that it takes typically three years to become a GP post foundation and five to eight years to become a consultant in a medical or surgical specialty. This is assuming that you work full time the whole way and don't take any career breaks which, as I've said, is getting rarer, so the time it takes to reach the consultant level is in reality a bit longer than that. Working less than full-time is becoming an increasingly popular choice for people. And typically when you finish higher specialty training, you have to do exit exams or something called a CCT, which stands for Certificate of Completion of Training. And you have to do this in order to become a consultant. So let's run through an example. Let's say you really want to be a neurologist. So to do this, you have to apply for core medical training, which is now known as IMT or internal medicine training. Now this involves three years of rotations in different medical specialties. After this, you have to apply for higher specialty training in neurology. And nowadays you have to get a dual accreditation in neurology and also in internal medicine. So this takes five years. So that's two years of foundation, three years of IMT, five years of higher specialty training, and then you're a consultant. Okay, so now that you've finished your higher specialty training and you've done your CCT, you've become a consultant and you can officially ditch the label of trainee. Along the way, you'll have faced many things such as postgraduate exams, interviews, job changes, location changes, and so on. One of the good things about being a junior doctor in the training system is that you always have senior doctors to escalate problems to and to call on to for support. So back in medical school, I used to be quite worried about what would happen if you were a consultant or a GP, because at this point, you may no longer have someone to escalate to but then a consultant on one of my placements told me something that actually made me feel a bit better they reminded me that you're rarely ever completely alone in medicine and even if you're a consultant and you're stuck you can still talk to your other consultant colleagues for advice and this made me feel a lot better at times this whole process can feel a bit like a conveyor belt that starts with students and churns out specialists but i think it's important to remember that it's not one size fits all and you can take breaks you can move in and out of training, you can change directions, you can even move to another country for a while. It's completely up to you. So I hope this video was useful. Thanks for watching, bye!